It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program Erwin Chemerinsky. He's the dean of the University of California, Berkeley Law School. Author, his most recent, uh, Worse Than Nothing, The Dangerous Fallacy of Originalism. Um, uh, Professor, uh, welcome to the program. It's great to be with you. Um, I I, I want to start but I don't want to linger too long right now on the title because I want to, I want to swing back to that after we go through uh, the argument you're making here, but worse than nothing uh, is a response to uh, the late Anthony Scalia, who was basically chiding anyone who was not a Federalist society person that like there are limits to originalism, but, you got nothing else essentially to argue against it. But, but your argument is it's worse than nothing. Exactly. It does come in response to justice Scalia. Justice Scalia responded to saying, I have a theory and they don't. And my point in the book is that it's a theory that is not at all useful and is dangerous. So it's actually worse than nothing. Um, I, you know, and and we'll, we'll, we'll talk more generally about the, about this, uh, about where originalism is in terms of like in terms of practice at, at this point in the um, in, in the the institution, I guess, of the law, broadly speaking. But let's talk about the rise of originalism. I did not know this uh, until I read your book, but it is amazing to me how many bad things Robert Bork like created for this country. I mean, it really is stunning to me how much one guy um, could uh, derail like things like uh, antitrust, but also um, the, really broadly our legal system. It's important to recognize that originalism developed, including by Bork, is a way of criticizing the liberal decisions of the Warren Court. Bork wrote his article in 1971, putting forth originalism. And we should be sure to define it. Originalism is the view that the meaning of a constitutional provision is fixed when it's adopted. They change only by amendment. So the First Amendment means the same thing today as was adopted in 1791. The 14th Amendment means the same thing as was adopted in 1868. Work had written that there should be no right to privacy under the Constitution, no protection, no right to purchase and use contraceptives, no right to abortion. He believed that there was no protection against sex discrimination, let alone sexual orientation discrimination in the Constitution, because the 14th Amendment was just meant to be about race discrimination. He thought that the First Amendment's protection of speech should only be about political speech. So no protection of speech that's for entertainment and certainly no protection of sexually oriented speech. Um, So let's... Uh, let's, uh, I mean, uh, broaden out a little bit in terms of that originalism, uh, so that we really, you know, do it justice, at least in terms of what the 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 idea is. It is a way of interpreting the Constitution that says what that you need to go to original intent or original meaning or um, or, or 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 what? I mean, originalism is just so uh, such a sort of a. a, a um, a vague term. I mean, you'll get in, we'll get it. We'll, we'll list the five problems that you do, but, but I want to try and steal man there. There are, I guess their philosophy. As Robert Bork and Roll Berger developed in the early seventies, the focus was on what did the framers intent of a constitutional provision mean? That was much criticized. After all, who were the framers? There were so many people involved in drafting and ratifying the constitution the myth to say there was an intent. So then originalists, including Justice Scalia, shifted and said, we'll look for the original public meaning. But we should note that originalists on the Supreme Court still shift between those two views. Last June, in a case called Kennedy versus Bremerton Schools, the Supreme Court said the meaning of the Establishment Clause, the provision there can be no law respecting the established religion, is determined by, quote, the views of the founding fathers. That's Framer's intent. Other times the court says, let's just focus on original meaning. It's always unclear, though. How do you determine the original meaning, especially hundreds of years later in a very different world? Do we even have a sense of what the, uh, I guess, the original intent of the idea of a constitution was? Like, I mean, do like like the very, like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like, even like backing up, never mind what the constitution says, 
But what was the, how did the writers, I, I mean, that's the thing too. It's like, we have the writers of the constitution. We have the ratifiers of the constitution. Uh, we have the people that they represent, but do we even have, or do they have, I guess those who subscribe to the original intent, do they have an idea about like what the purpose of the constitution was? I think so. I don't think there's dispute about the original goals of the constitution. It was meant to set out a framework for government that could be much more effective than the Articles of Confederation. In fact, I think the preamble to the constitution does a good job of setting out its goals. But where I think this becomes more difficult is with regard to judicial review, the power of courts to strike down laws or executive actions, the power of courts to interpret the Constitution. There's nothing in the Constitution that describes a power of judicial review. There was no discussion of it at the Constitutional Convention in 1787. So when we're talking about originalism, we're talking about what was the theory of interpreting the Constitution that the framers had in mind for the courts when the framers apparently didn't talk about what the role of the court should be at all. Do we have any even like speculation as to what it could have been? I mean, based upon the way that uh, judges functioned at that time, or uh, I mean, it really is an amazing, it's either an amazing oversight or it's an amazing recognition that this is something that's going to evolve and change depending upon what the, the sort of the, I guess, the expectations of the day are. Let me start with the latter. In 1819, in McCulloch versus Maryland, Chief Justice John Marshall, who had been one of the framers in Philadelphia in 1787, said, and I'm quoting, we must never forget that it's a constitution we're expounding. Constitution must be adapted and endure for ages to come. I think it is very difficult to know what the framers thought about judicial review because they didn't say. Maybe they assumed there would be judicial review. Some states like Pennsylvania had it. Maybe they assumed it wouldn't exist because it didn't exist and doesn't now in England. Or maybe they just didn't focus on it at all. But it's hard to take the modern practice of judicial review and see it as deriving from anything the framers had in mind when they wrote the Constitution. But isn't that kind of the point, right? I mean, isn't the point that it's this kind of fanciful argument that only conservatives are engaging in because liberal justices aren't making determinations about what the founders intended? The only people playing that game are, is the right, and that's you know a, a way they can work backwards from their conclusions. I think that's exactly what's happening. Is I think that the conservative justices are coming to conservative conclusions and then justifying it by finding the fragments in the historical record to support what they want to do. Think of the end of last June. The Supreme Court said that in certain circumstances, the government is required to subsidize religious schools if it gives money for secular private schools. The court said the only regulation of guns that be allowed is that which was permitted in 1791 or maybe 1868. The court said there's no right to abortion in the Constitution. The court said that it violated the free speech rights and free exercise religion rights of a high school football coach to keep him going on the field and praying. Unless you believe that the framers' intent in 1787 and 1791 was the same as the current Republican platform, what you see is the conservative justices are coming to conservative conclusions and then dressing it up as originalism. Uh, let's talk about your five sort of problems with originalism. Uh, this is in terms of a methodology of approaching uh, the the Constitution. the The first one is um, you call the epistemological problem. Uh, uh, what is that? We've already touched on it. So many people were involved in drafting the ratifying the Constitution. It's impossible to say there was an intent to be discovered. Even if we focus on original meaning, practices at the time varied. There's no reason to believe that what was done in 1787 or 1791 is what the framers meant to enshrine and protect for all time. All right. So let's just be like, if, if we're looking at a law uh, that is passed, right? I mean, I know the court does this. They're looking at a federal, they'll look at the federal register and they'll see what the debate was in the, uh, 
House and the Senate. And ostensibly, that's the way that you can glean the intent of of uh, Congress in passing a law. Um, and your argument is we can't do that with the Constitution because they didn't keep the records in the same way that uh, it was too disparate. What 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 is the why can we do that for a law? And 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 just let me just also preface this too. I can't help but think about Scalia in the uh, Voting Rights Act uh, uh, case, the Shelby case, where he basically said uh, this was their intent, but they, they were so afraid. That's why they passed the they, they reauthorized the Voting Rights Act. So he, I, I but 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 please. Sorry. Original well, question. There's so much in the question. First, the conservative justices have rejected looking at legislative history when it comes to statutory questions. They've said when it comes to interpreting statutes, we shouldn't be looking at the congressional history, statements in the House and Senate reports, because that's all too invented and too inconclusive. So the same criticism that Justice Scalia has made about looking at legislative history in the statutory context applies here as well. Second, it's all of the problems that you identified. There was no transcript of what went on in the Constitutional Convention in 1787. James Madison took the notes, but they are very incomplete. Also, there's limited records that went on in the state ratifying conventions. It's hard from this to say we know the original meaning. When I teach constitutional law, when I did this semester, I like to point to all of the places where Alexander Hamilton and James Madison disagreed about major questions. And if they, in hindsight, weren't in agreement, who are we going to say was the framer of the Constitution? Um, and and to what extent the w do original originalists move to become textualists, and and how is it really in any way different? Because isn't a textualist really like a, 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 a an originalist who's interested in meaning as opposed to intent? All justices start with the text of the Constitution. The problem is that the text rarely resolves any of the issues that come before the court. What's cruel and unusual punishment? The first case I ever argued in the Supreme Court about a man who was sentenced to 50 years to life in prison for stealing $153 with their videotapes. I argued it was cruel and unusual punishment. Five justices rejected that. What's due process of law? What's liberty? What's free exercise of religion? How are these to be balanced against other interests? The text answers none of those questions. Um, let's move on to the incoherence problem. Um, how do you, how do you, uh, what is the incoherence problem with uh, originalism? We touched on this too. If we want to be originalists, we should have to follow the framers in about how the Constitution should be interpreted. But the framers didn't want their intent to be controlling. There's a terrific article by Jeff Powell, a Duke law professor in the 1980s. I think it was titled The Original Understanding of Original Understanding. And he made a compelling case that the framers never imagined that their views would be controlling. Horst Bitker, a Yale law professor, also had an excellent article for this. So if we're originalists, then doesn't originalism compel us to abandon originalism? Okay, we're, like we're, tease that out for me. When you say they didn't intend for their uh, opinions to be controlling, um, uh, that means that the the framers, if we we are to sort of like concede that we could identify who the framers were, exclude some, include others. Uh, that they never meant for their ideas about what they were writing necessarily to be the end all be all that they were completely uh, rigid about it. So um, yeah, how does originalism like, so then the original, if we are actually subscribing to the originalists intent, their intent is that n you should not be originalists essentially is what the argument is. But how do we know that they didn't, w they didn't contemplate their words to be controlling? We of course don't know what they intended with regard to how court should interpret the constitution. 
because the power of courts to interpret the Constitution is never mentioned and it wasn't discussed. Now, the reality is they looked at jurisprudence so differently than we do today. They believed that there was a natural law that was out there and that would be mechanically applied by judges. No longer do people believe that. So it's very difficult to take their philosophy of judging and apply it to the 21st century. But in terms of how do we know, I'll go back to the words of John Marshall, where he said, it's a constitution meant to be adapted and endure for ages to come. And John Marshall was one of the framers in Philadelphia in 1787. Um, the next problem you have is the abhorrence uh, problem, which I think is a little bit more um, obvious um, to, to at least the, to, to my ears, and that is simply if you actually um, interpret the Constitution in the way that the originalists want, uh, th we would be living a horrible life. <laughs> well, it would lead to constitutional jurisprudence that few, if any, of us would want. Under originalism, Brown versus Board of Education was wrongly decided. The same Congress that ratified the 14th Amendment voted to segregate the District of Columbia public schools. There's simply no evidence that Congress meant in proposing and ratifying the 14th Amendment to outlaw segregation. Under originalism, Loving versus Virginia was wrongly decided. Loving was the 1967 case that said that states cannot prohibit interracial marriage. Most states prohibited interracial marriage in 1868. California had a law that prohibited interracial marriage till 1948. As recently as 1967, when Loving was decided, 16 states still prohibited interracial marriage. Or take the Constitution's prohibition of sex discrimination or sexual orientation or gender identity discrimination. Justice Scalia was fond of saying there is no constitutional prohibition of sex discrimination because the framers of the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause, were just focused on race. I would say any theory that makes Brown and Loving and a prohibition of sex discrimination illegitimate has to be one we reject. In, in fact, uh, Scalia referred to himself as a faint-hearted originalist. And to me, that gives away the game, right? Because the, the whole point of originalism is that this is a static document that we can divine the uh, the meaning of it because it exists completely separate from outcomes or context or anything. It was enshrined, and it's just a matter of like wiping the dust off of the uh, the the you know the tablets that it was imprinted upon. How can you be a faint-hearted one of those? That doesn't, it, it doesn't, that, that to me seems to be an incredible contradiction and an admission that we really can't do it this way or we're going to have a horrible country. I, of course, agree with everything that you just said. Let me try to put Justice Scalia's comment in context. Justice Thomas has said repeatedly that precedent should deserve no weight in constitutional law and all prior decisions inconsistent with originalism should be overruled. And Justice Thomas has said this on many occasions. And countless decisions would have to be overruled by the Supreme Court if it was to be originalist. For example, no longer would the Bill of Rights apply to state and local governments. Justice Scalia, in response to that, said, I don't want to overrule all of those prior decisions. And it led him to say, I'm a faint-hearted originalist. Well, I mean, so it occurred to me when Sam framed it that way that they're essentially grafting on a fundamentalist religious uh, kind of perspective of the world onto the document as if it is some sort of biblical text, like where you you uh, you're kind of working for outcomes to fit into it, but it also cannot be questioned at the same time, which seems to be as antithetical to what the founders intended as anything given, you know, what the First Amendment says. I think your analogy to fundamentalism and religion is very apt. I think fundamentalists want to say, let's literally follow the text, whereas I think originalists want to say, let's follow the text in the original meaning, but only that. And, of course, even for fundamentalists in religion, 
there's still interpretation required for the modern world. If somebody wants to be a very observant Jew, what does that tell us about turning on lights on the Sabbath or turning on the stove on the Sabbath? You're not going to find that in the text. You still have to interpret the text. Well, likewise, somebody still has to interpret the Constitution. And I think the same arguments for rejecting fundamentalism in the religious context apply the way we should reject fundamentalism in the constitutional context. And of course, in the constitutional context, we live in a very different world today than that of the late 18th century. Well, this is what you refer to as the uh, modernity problem. Um, expand on that. I mean, a, a little bit more. I mean, obviously, like there's, um, I mean, a well-regulated militia comes to mind. It does, of course. Um, we live, as I just said, and as we all know, it's such a different world in 1787 or 1791. It's difficult to see that their answers should be those for ours. You mentioned the Second Amendment. Well, should the Second Amendment be limited to just protecting the muskets that were there then? The Supreme Court says no, but we live in a world where there are AR-15s and mass shootings on a regular basis. We live in a world with much greater population density. Why does it make sense to just look to 1791? Whereas an example of the modernity problem, there's a Supreme Court case five years ago that involved whether the police need a warrant before they obtain a large amount of cellular location information about a person. Our cell phones are constantly connecting to cell towers, so long as they're on, even not using them. The police, if they get that cellular location information, can, with a fair degree of precision, pinpoint where we were at any point in time. Should that require a warrant? Well, Justice, Justice Thomas in his dissent says, no, because, of course, in 1791, that wouldn't have been a search. He says there's no invasion of physical property rights. Thankfully, the majority rejected that because it makes no sense for the meaning of the Fourth Amendment to be limited to what the framers knew in technology in 1791. Um, and then you uh, refer to the hypocrisy problem. Which one is that? This is the point that originalists abandon originalism when it doesn't get to the conclusion they want. In 2010, the conservative justices including the self-avowed originalists, cited Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission and held that corporations have the right to spend unlimited amounts of money in election campaigns to can't select or defeat it. It's impossible to say that the framers intended this. Corporations, as we know them today, didn't exist then, and campaign spending didn't exist then. Or in the next couple of months, the Supreme Court is likely to hold that college university can't engage in affirmative action seems clear to me in the historical record that the framers of the 14th Amendment meant to allow what we would call today as affirmative action. They approved many race-conscious programs, the sort that we describe as affirmative action. But I don't think that the conservatives are going to pay any attention to that history. So it's basically like um, originalism when it works for uh, our uh, preferred outcomes and not when it doesn't. Let's, I mean, the... The, the, your book outlines really a a fifty year um, project to create this legal philosophy that is um, really more like a. It, it seems to me, I think you know, and your book uh, uh, makes a fine uh, makes it makes it quite clear that this is really more of a branding exercise on how to dress up, getting to your preferred conclusions uh, more often than not. And the, it, it also seems to me, in my experience, that they have done a great job at this, that even, and maybe less so today, and, I, and I'm, I'm curious as to your opinion on that, but like 10, 15 years ago, there were uh, people who disagreed with originalism, who gave it at least some authority and uh, took it as a good faith sort of like philosophy. Uh, why were they able to do this? When the the other side, as as you know, as Scalia said, it's better than nothing. Wasn't able to develop a similar sort of competing philosophy. I'll start by going back to where you began, Robert Bork. 
because of his originalist philosophy, he got rejected by the Senate for a Supreme Court seat back in 1987. More senators voted against Bork than against any other nominee in American history because originalism was seen as unacceptable. The Federalist Society and conservatives have launched a 50-year campaign. I think some of the success of originalism is it seems so simple. Just follow the original meaning of the document. It's only when you think about it you realize how little sense that makes to take the original meaning of a document from 1787 and have it be controlling in 2023. In terms of the latter part of your question, I don't think there is a simple alternative theory. I don't think there's a theory at all that gives us determinate results in constitutional cases. The reality is the outcome of cases depends on who's on the court. If Hillary Clinton had won the election in 2016, and if she had picked the replacements for Justice Scalia, Kennedy, and Ginsburg, we wouldn't be having this conversation. There'd be one originalist justice on the court, Justice Thomas. He would write angry dissents. Conservative law professors would write articles defending originalism. But because Justice Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett were put on the court, joining conservatives, Robert Salito and Thomas, it's a totally different court and one where originalism is now in ascendancy. I, I'm, it, it, it's in ascendancy in practice, at least, but it seems like there's also a lot less sort of defense of it because they don't need to defend it anymore. Like, it, I mean, it's almost like... The, the analogy I would say is that, you know, the like deficit spending, which was for the Republicans, a huge sort of like a tent pole has almost or I should say a deficit reduction has almost gone away because they just sort of it, it was no longer um, helpful to them. It, it doesn't feel to me like there is as much of talk about originalism anymore because they realize like we don't re it, that would only constrain us at this point. I think that's right. You no longer hear conservatives talk about judicial restraint. That was the mantra of conservatives from Richard Nixon until recently, but they've given that up. Um, I think your analogy to conservatives and the deficit is telling. When Donald Trump was president and they were cutting taxes, there was no talk about deficit. But now with the debt ceiling looming, conservatives are embracing the need for deficit reduction. So the arguments that people make are the ones that serve the agenda they want to achieve. And that's true of liberals and conservatives. Is there really no, though, opportunity for uh, liberals or left or center uh, to the right to, 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 to engage at least on the level of where the Federalist Society has? I mean, I, you know, like I, 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 I seem to rem remember running into this sort of similar dynamic in education where um, when the when the big sort of corporate uh, so-called education reform movement was happening, they had the ability to create sort of like slogans that were very effective politically, you know, value add accountability, you know, leave no child behind all these things. But re genuine educators the 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 nature of education of good education is that it must be specific to the the student and um and it was so contextualized that it was hard to come up with a sort of broad slogan that could be sold in the way that uh the the reform movement had this seems like to be a problem with with the center left in terms of the legal institution or is it is it just also impossible for them to concede the legal institution that really, to a large extent, judges are predetermining outcomes and reverse engineering things. Who is on the court is going to determine the outcome in so many cases. That's certainly true in the Supreme Court. The reason that Justices Scalia and Ginsburg disagreed so often isn't that one was smarter or knew the Constitution better. They just started with different values. If Hillary Clinton had picked three justices, Roe versus Wade wouldn't have been overruled. And I think we have to acknowledge that. I think that liberals need to come up with a better way of defending their alternative and need to find a way of explaining to people that inherently constitutional law is about values and it's who's on the court that matters. So it means that elections really matter.
Erwin Chemerinsky, Dean of the University of California, Berkeley Law School. The book is Worse Than Nothing, The Dangerous Fallacy of Originalism. Thanks so much uh, for coming on today. We'll put a link to that at majority.fm and in our YouTube and podcast description. Thanks so much for having me on. Truly a pleasure. Thank you.